So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm sorry in advance, it could be a few people in the audience who saw uh, or heard me or my co-author Florian Richter talking about this. Uh, I still will be saying things behind the, the slides which could be different things and discussion could be different. So uh, second apology is to those who fully understand the topic and maybe we'll find portion of it a little bit boring, sorry. I try to, to cater to, to wide audience. And so I will start. Um, so we are interested in two actions. Uh, they would be semi-group actions, but these are nice semi-groups, uh, consultative semi-groups, and plus and then times uh, the interaction of these two structures and integers is enormously interesting and fascinating. And uh, what we propose is to look at the new kind of ergodic theorems, which in a sort uh, intertwine these two actions. We will see these two semigroups. We'll see how it goes. So the very first page, I just want to, to set up some notation. Again, apologies, that's totally well known. But since uh, I'm in US, so my N, the natural number starts with one. And uh, we all know what are primes. So one of the uh, heroes uh, is uh, omega n, large omega n, the number of prime factors of uh, integer n. And then the, maybe occasionally we'll see small omega n. Uh, so in capital omega n, we count them with multiplicity and little omega n doesn't count them with multiplicity. And uh, there are people here who know these things much better than me. It seems that in, on many occasions, asymptotical properties and uh, all kinds of averageable, averaging results along capital omega and small omega are very similar. <clears throat> now, of course, there is also Liouville function related to omega n. Here's definition. And, uh, and there is, of course, a Möbius function. Möbius function uh, is especially attractive for a variety of reasons. It connects to square free numbers, which are my favorite, and they have very nice natural density. In any case, I will keep going. And uh, now we can discuss some classical results. These are well known to many of you, uh, some equivalent forms of prime number theorem. And so the first one just tells us that uh, those n for which omega is even, I call them sometimes multiplicatively even numbers. And those for which omega is odd, they have additive natural density one half. And this is very nice and pleasing fact, but uh, it is deep or deep enough. It's equivalent to PNT. And uh, I was able to trace uh, the authorship to von Mangold and uh, Landau. If there are people here who know more of history of these statements, I would be very, very glad to know about that. So again, the fact that lambda n averages to zero is yet another form of PNT. And uh, that uh, mu n, this is the previous sum, and now we skip the square free numbers. So all these results are classical versions and forms of PNT, and we will try to see uh, if they can be embedded as, a spe as special cases of some <coughs> natural enough, dynamically natural enough ergodic theorems. So, but uh, let us stay a little bit uh, on, on results uh, about uh, distribution of omega, capital omega in different classes of numbers. So natural generalization of the first bullet is uh, so-called Pillai-Selberg theorem, which says that uh, omega n is equidistributed in these modular sets and with, with a correct uh, distribution, so to say. And then there is a, a little bit more modern a result uh, due to Erdos and Delange that if alpha is irrational, then you again have a sort of a similar result. So I here I formulated 
in a shape close to just the definition of uniform distribution. And uh, the interpretation for us is that uh, if you take these sets, alpha m plus beta, they are sometimes called BT sequences. And they're popular in some, some quarters. Uh, and so they have natural distribution in these sets. I mean, the natural density of omega of ends for which omega of n belongs to such alpha m plus beta set is one over alpha. So if you believe in very good equidistributional properties of omega, that's all guessable. Or at least after you see a few of such results, you start thinking that they're very, very nice, nicely distributed. So let us move now to ergodic approach. So just to, to set up uh, terminology, uh, additive topological system is just a pair. You take a, you have a compact uh, metric space and you have a homeomorphism or continuous map. Now it's not really strictly speaking the pair X T, but the pair X and all iterations of T, which is a topological dynamical system. But if you have T, you can take iterations, of course. Now, and there are many uh, classical uh, such systems which have extremely good properties also from measure theoretical point of view. And so let's discuss this. So we start with uh, pure topology, topological compact space and a continuous map. And then there is classical result by Bogolubov Krylov, which says that uh, any topological system has a uh, T invariant probability measure on the Borel sigma algebra. Sometimes it may be just a fixed point, which is not terribly interesting, but uh, suppose you have an irrational rotation on unit circle, then it is our familiar uh, Haar measure. And we always try to normalize this measure. So I talk here about finite measures. It's totally separate and pretty interesting for ergodic people question, uh, what about sigma, finite measures, we will not touch it at all. So our measures will be always normalized. And so if uh, there is only one such T invariant measure, we call the system uniquely ergodic. Now why ergodic? Because if system is, uh, if uh, this measure is unique, then system is automatically ergodic with respect to transformation T. Um, again, the example I gave you already, the translations, irrational translations on, on torus are uniquely ergodic. That's actually easy exercise. You can try to do it two ways. One way, think of alpha irrational, then N alpha is dense, and then invoke uniqueness of Haar measure. And you may want to do it other ways. So I will leave it at that. Now there exists uh, another, Interesting example of systems, maybe we'll, ah, yes, here it is, skew products. So look at this one, x, y going to x plus alpha, y plus x. It's called skew product in ergodic theory. They are very nice systems related to uniform distribution along polynomials. We will maybe refer to them later, but before we go to some, additional formulations or rotations already mentioned, but the, the simple system, cyclic permutation on any finite set is also, <clears throat> and this is meaningful actually. All right, are there any questions so far, especially about ergodic part? So it seems that there are no questions, I will keep going. <clears throat> so here is a classical fact. So we all know that uh, ergodic uh, theorems are about, uh, and let me be philosophical, they're about equality of two things, uh, time average and space average. That's what is ergodic principle. And it's very prominent in number theory. Uh, say uniform distribution is nothing as a instance of this ergodic princ principle. So on the left, you usually have Cesaro averages, this is time average. You may think of your system T corresponding to measurements every second. Okay, this is time average. 
And on the right, you have a space average. If uh, my space would have measure, which is not one, I would have to divide by measure of the space, but my measure is normalized. So the right-hand side is just space average. So ergodic theory is about e equality of time and space averages. Now, if your measure is unique, then you expect this to happen not only for almost every point. If you have an ergodic system, there's classical point-wise ergodic theorem tells you that for almost every point, the orbit is uniformly distributed. Here, our life is way better. First of all, it's for every x. And second, which I didn't mention here, but these averages can be taken along any sequence of um, uh, increasing intervals, increasing in size. Indeed, for those who know what is amenability, you can take any uh, Fjolnir sequences and it will be still the same. There is one uh, though restriction, uh, unlike the classical ergodic theorem, which uh, is valid in LP spaces and L1 say, here we want to restrict ourselves to topologically sound function. So here I wrote continuous, but any Riemann integrable will be fine, but not more general, really. Okay, so here is our theorem, one of a few that we have, but this is a simpler formulation. So take now uniquely ergodic system. And now it's a funny mix of two things. Instead of taking T to power N, like we had it here, right? So that's what be natural for the, ergodic theory of as actions of additive integers. Here I take it to power omega of n, same omega that we introduced on the first page. And it turns out that if system is uniquely ergodic, then you still have correct limit. And this result uh, has multiple uh, applications to number theory, which we will list now. And it's really a beginning of a quest for something even more maybe dramatic. But in any case, uh, this result itself has a simple formulation. And let's see what, what you can get just from this result. And by the way, uh, to think again, ergodically, what it means that uh, you take a point X and you consider omega orbit, so to say, you just consider powers along omega of n, and they uniformly distributed. That's what is uh, written just here. Okay, so what are the applications? Take the simplest possible system, rotation on two points, x going to x plus one mod two. And take a simple function, f of zero is one, f of one is zero. And then uh, it takes maybe 20 seconds to, to think a little bit, but you will see that the, the left-hand side then becomes density of the set of those n for which omega one is even. And this is one half because integral of this, don't forget my measure is normalized. So integral of this function is one half. So this is one of the formulations. I think I can jump here. This is uh, the very first bullet on page two. So we got it by applying this ergodic theorem to, to this simple, rotation on two points. Now let's go, by the way, I call it pilai selberg Maybe I should call it, I, I think I confused a little bit between, I oh, know pilai selberg is okay. Later I will be talking about Erdős Pillai. That will be a confusion. pilai selberg is fine. So let's go back to this statement. So now I take a system on M points. It's a rotation mode M. And very similarly to previous example, you will get equidistribution of omega uh, in those modularly defined sets. Now let's go to Erdős de Lange. Actually, surprisingly, the proofs uh, of Erdős and de Lange, Erdős actually, I think, only mentions it and says that proof is not totally trivial. And de Lange gives a proof. And uh, here I have to make, by the way, a apologetic statement. Uh, we are getting these nice results so relatively easily because we don't care about or oh, cannot maybe handle them well, the, the bounds. 
uh, we don't deal with serious number theoretical estimates. The methods of classical number theory, they involve estimates sometimes as part of the process of the proof. So because our approach is softer, we cannot, you know, say anything new about any estimates, but we can show maybe new results and get the old result in, in relatively unified fashion. So Erdős de Lange is also corollary of this theorem, theorem A. And to see it, you take again uh, this function and you consider rotation by irrational alpha. You substitute this continuous function f into my system, into my formula here in theorem A, and you will get a wild criterion form of a uniform distribution. So we get uh, Pillai Selber, uh, sorry, Argos de Lange also is a special case. Now, pay attention, you already got uh, a few pretty nice corollaries by considering pretty uh, simple, I would even say primitive uh, dynamical system. So let's take one step up. And what happens if I would consider systems like this one, or maybe it's more general forms, that's uh, the skew product can be defined on, on any finite dimensional torus. This is actually a special case of so-called nil system. And nil systems are known to be uniquely ergodic on their minimal components. So in principle, we can expect additional interesting applications because there is a good supply of natural uh, uniquely ergodic systems of algebraic origin. So here's a, one of such applications. And that's where I'm confusing names. So I, I'm not sure I should call it Erdős Pillai. Maybe I should call it Erdős Dilange. But uh, sorry about that. But uh, here is the formulation. So take a polynomial, a standard polynomial of that kind to which while the uh, theorem on poly, uh, uniform distribution of polynomials applies. And if you substitute omega inside, it is uniformly distributed. And I'm not sure, but uh, it seems that this polynomial version is actually a new result. I, I could not find it in classical literature. And it's pretty nice. So substituting omega n instead of n uh, keeps uniform distribution. This is part uh, of something bigger. So I will talk about this later, but uh, let's remember this. The fact that Q of n is uniformly distributed, this is classical result of Y. And you can also prove it dynamically if you use uh, skew products. This was, by the way, observed uh, already in thesis of uh, Hillel Furstenberg. And uh, we are using this, namely the idea of uh, applying uh, dynamics. Namely, I can generate such a polynomial by using skew products. And then, uh, because Q products, uh, if ergodic, are uniquely ergodic, and uh, they are ergodic because we assume that at least one of the coefficients from C1 to CK is irrational. So then again, it's a just application of our theorem A. Now, what is, but we don't have to stop with Q products. So there is a even bigger class of uh, interesting uniquely ergodic system. These are translations on nil manifolds. So I didn't define it here. Let me in few words explain how one can think about this. Take uh, three by three matrices, uh, which are upper diagonal, ones on diagonal and the X, Y, Z, say, suppose it is three by three. So matrices, three by three, ones on diagonal, zeros below diagonal and uh, above the diagonal are real numbers. And now there is a subgroup discrete subgroup uh, of the same kind when the, the entries above the diagonal are integers. So factor out, it will be a sort of similar to how we create three-dimensional torus by taking R3 over Z3. And uh, this would be an example of a nil system. Now, if you apply a theorem A to nil systems, then uh, and invoke a result which I have with uh, Sasha Leibman, then uh, you can get uh, even more impressive uh, uniform distribution results. So let me first of all define what is generalized polynomial. And I would like to make some propaganda for generalized polynomials because they turned out eventually to be indeed in, uh, very interestingly connecting many sub areas of uh, 
combinatorics, number theory, and ergodic theory. Where they start, uh, the definition is more or less natural. You just take regular polynomials like Q of n, and you allow one more operation, taking an um, integer part. Well, if you, and the, the rest of the arithmetical operations. If you allow integer part, you should uh, equally allow, say, fractional part because it's expressible through integer part. So, in other words, uh, uh, not so formal definition of generalized polynomials is uh, take a regular polynomial and sprinkle brackets inside. Just sprinkle them properly so there is always to any right bracket, left bracket corresponds, and so on. This will be generalized polynomial. So, in as a very special case, for example, this expression is a generalized polynomial. Now I already put omega in, but suppose it would be just n alpha bracket beta, this would be a generalized polynomial. Pay attention that in this theorem, the first bullet on this page, they were already some primitive generalized polynomials because the results about mod one. When you take mod one, this polynomial mod one is already a generalized polynomial because you used fractional part, okay? The point is that you can use a fractional or integer part as many times as you want. And now we have the following result. So before I will come back to its formulation here in the middle, I just want to tell you that uh, we have a, a theorem with Sasha Lehman, which says that any bounded generalized polynomial comes a very dynamical way. It is just f of t and x, where t is a uniquely ergodic nil translation. And f is uh, not necessarily continuous, but nice enough, say Riemann integrable function. It's actually a little bit better than that, uh, than general Riemann integrable, but that's all which we need. And so just because of this, and so then if I take a generalized polynomial, for example, n alpha beta and put instead of n omega, it will be, oh, n alpha bracket n beta. And I put uh, omega instead of n, I will get things of this kind. So here is the more general result. So take any generalized polynomial, I'm using Q for polynomial, so this Q is written as if it is rational numbers. No, it's just a polynomial Q, okay? And uh, take any generalized polynomial and assume that Q of n is uniformly distributed. Then Q of omega of n also is. I intentionally formulated it in this form because I think there is enormously interesting principle behind it. So let me spend a minute on this. So. This adds to collection of theorems uh, that uh, have the following feature. You have some uniform distribution result involving parameter n, and you put instead of n, n square, and it's still uniformly distributed. Or uh, to have even bigger picture, suppose you take an ergodic theorem, which goes along n's, uh, and then instead of n, I will put n square. And then it's still an ergodic theorem with almost the same uh, conditions which I needed for it to give correct limit. Uh, Jean Bourguin proved that uh, almost everywhere even is true in LP spaces for P bigger than one. That's a little bit too technical, but the rule of thumb, which we observe in ergodic theory and in combinatorics is that you can replace N by polynomials of N and things still remain true. This actually applies to another theorem which Sasha Leibman and I have, it's called polynomial Semeredi theorem. So Semeredi theorem tells you that any set of positive density contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions, what Sasha Lehman and I proved that it contains arbitrarily long polynomial progressions. You allow jumps, not just n to n, three n, any polynomials, which say have zero at zero to avoid local obstructions. So we have yet another instance of this uh, very, very interesting principle, replace n by n square or replace n in this case by omega of n and results still remain true. So to better understand what's going on, I think it's very interesting direction for thinking, okay? So this is an instance of classical results remaining true. You see here it's sort of double substitution. First of all, we had polynomial uniform distribution. That's why that itself is very interesting. And then you put instead of n omega and it's still true. So that's something, some curious principle which needs more development, I believe. All right, now let's go back to uh, 
PNT statements. You see, all the statements, they already statements on average, and they can be already interpreted ergodically because uh, these functions uh, take values plus minus one so evenly that you can think that the, the integral, if it's involved there, should be zero. So the time average is the same as space average. That's not too far fetched, but to make it a little bit uh, even more visible, take any uniquely ergodic system. And let us take this pattern. You take the ergodic limits along ends which are, which are square free, like in this version of PNT. If you use this with some improvements uh, in our theorem A, you will get this result. This result is uh, really open to nice interpretation. So let's look at it. Of course, six over pi square appears here because of the density of square free numbers. That's, if you will, integral of the characteristic function of square free numbers. And you can think that in the left-hand side, you would multiply by indicator function of square free numbers, then, then, then it will help you to see that summation is only over square free numbers. So in the left, you have product of two functions. And on the right, you have product of the integrals. So that's a manifestation of ergodicity in new uh, convenient shape, namely its independence. <clears throat> Okay, so we'll come back to independence and try to analyze it a little bit more carefully. But I suggest to, to see this result as independence. I repeat, why independence? Because on the left, if you multiply left-hand side by indicator function of square free numbers, it's product of two functions and the limit is product of their integrals. In generalized sense, I think of six over pi square as integral of characteristic function of uh, square free numbers. So here is a guessable, if you start believing in this, you can guess this result, right? So take now summation along K free numbers and the limit should be, if there is any justice, and in this case, there is justice, it will be one over zeta of K times integral over. Okay, so it's time now to introduce uh, multiplicative dynamical systems. But we will see uh, soon that these results about independence, they also, manifestation of some very interesting principle which tells us something about independence of actions of n plus and n times. And that's the goal of my talk. So, um, one observation before I will make general definition. So, so far we were considering t to power omega of n. This is in our theorem, I can keep jumping, so theorem A, Oops, that's not this, theorem A, not this, theorem A. So if you consider T to power omega of N and because of properties of omega of N, then uh, just let me move. Yes, then you will see that uh, this is uh, an example of action of multiplicative integers, right? So because of, properties of omega, t to power omega of n times m is t to power omega of n times t to power omega of n. So why don't we define it now generally and try to maybe generalize. So let me remember, I'm going to page seven. If I go back to page three, indeed four. So maybe I can try to, to make a more general expression on the left, which will somehow involve both additive and multiplicative actions. And then on the right, it will expect some independence manifested by product of integrals. That's what we are planning to do right now. So definition. So we know already what is additive topological system, just a homomorph homeomorphism or continuous map and its iterations acting on a compact space. And now we can do the same with the multiplicative integer. So it will be a pair. Ys, Y is compact metric space, and S is an action of multiplicative integer. So it denoted it with S sub n. And the postulated property is that S sub n times m is S n times S m. That's the action of multiplicative integers. And we had already this example. So it gave us a lot of uh, applications. Now we can define uh, 
formally and uh, conveniently uh, multiplicative uh, rotations, so to say, on torus by taking any multiplicative function, B of n, and uh, defining uh, action S sub n of z to be B of n times z. Z is in S1 in the unit circle. And this will be uh, already an action. And of course, then we want to make y to be compact space. So I take just this orbit and take a closure. So there are many ways of uh, defining multiplicative topological dynamical systems. The, here's one more just for you to realize that there are many of them. Take any subset of integers and assume that it is a, a non trivial from the point of view of multiplicative structure. You can take its uh, orbital closure, so to say. You take the space of all sequences. And uh, any subset is a zero one sequence, right? Any subset is identifiable with its uh, indicator function. So subsets in N are the same as zero one sequences. The space of zero one sequences is a nice compact disconnected space. There you can take uh, orbits, orbits under some action, either under action of shift, that's Z plus action, or you can multiply the coordinate by m. So it was z sub n or x sub n and becomes x sub n m. And you can take these sequences in this uh, symbolic space of all sequences and take their orbital closures and you will get a lot, a lot of multiplicative systems. It's meaningful when you want to deal with uh, generalized notions of normality. So it's totally not my topic today. So back to multiplicative systems. Uh, there is a version of Bogolubov Krylov. So Bogolubov <coughs> Krylov uh, theorem still is valid for any amenable uh, group or nice amenable semigroup, and n times is amenable nice semigroup. So you have always n invariant measure, invariant now with respect to action of S n. If such a measure is unique, we will call it uniquely ergodic. So then the question is. Is the theorem A that we formulated at the beginning and applied a few times, is it a special case of a more general theorem dealing with multiplicative systems? Because T to power omega is a multiplicative system. So now I will have to ask you to trust me that these uh, somewhat restricting definitions are not too restricting. And uh, uh, it's a special discussion how to relax it or if it will help. but. Uh, let us assume for now that uh, my system is, remember, so far we dealt with single t, t to power omega n. I am ready now to allow finitely many such t's. So my system is finitely generated if the s, the generators of Sn, and these are the generators of my action are s sub p for p being prime, right? Everything can be made as product of primes. So I want this set of primes which are involved in generating Sn to be fine. That's already much more than single T, but uh, it's still pretty manageable. And second assumption, which I don't want even to start defining, it's a little bit too technical, but trust me, it's not terribly bad. It's a unique ergodicity in a somewhat strengthened form. So we call it strongly uniquely ergodic. And then we have uh, the following analog of theorem A, but in this more general shape, uh, with expectation it will give us additional applications. And so the theorem is that if you take a finitely generated multiplicative dynamical system, which is strongly uniquely ergodic, then you have the same kind of result. And now let us see. So this is theorem B. And the corollaries of theorem B already involve, first of all, more general form of some, nice sorry, the, question there? The integral of F is the integral of G. Uh, oh, very good point. Thank you. G equals F in this statement. You have a sharp I. Yes, F equals G, I forgot to tell you. So you should assume also, let take also F and G and assume that F equals G. I'm joking, but yes, F equals G. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
Let me for now skip this corollary because I want to, I'm worried that I will not have time to discuss something more fundamental that I want. And now it is a attempt to take a, this independence uh, influence to look at uh, Peter Sarnak's conjecture. So let us introduce again some definitions. So you take uh, two bounded arithmetic functions. So A of N and maybe complex value. So you take A of N times B of N and sum it up. And uh, you compare it with a product of uh, averages of A and B separately. If this limit is zero, then I hope you agree that we can call them independent. Because each, the limit of each of these averages can be, you know, in generalized sense to be thought of as integral of A of N. And so the products, the scalar products go to, to correct limit. So it's independence indeed. You can also interpret it as orthogonality if you want, if those, at least one of those uh, averages goes to zero. And, um, but what we want to do, and it is in, in line with what we discussed so far, we are interested in uh, those cases when this formula star holds for two uh, sequences coming from two different worlds. One comes from ADT world and one comes from multiplicity world. Or because we will be considering orbits, one comes from additive topological system and one comes from multiplicative topological system. The examples which I showed to you so far indicate that maybe there is some, let's call it disjointness, Phenomenon. So what is formal definition of disjoint here? And I apologize, disjoint is overloaded word. And um, we just couldn't find something better to describe what we want. Sorry about that. So you take an additive system and you take a multiplicative system. Remember XT is additive. You consider T together with all of its iterates and the S contains S sub Ns which behave multiplicative. So we call these two systems disjoint and it's pretty strong condition. If for every point in X, every point in Y, every function F in C of X, and this time I want G indeed not to be equal F, and G a function in C of Y, if I want for all this situation when I define A of N to be orbit of X, additive orbit, as you see, and B to be orbit of Y in space Y, I want A of N and B of N to satisfy formula star. So in this case, I will think of these two systems as disjoint. And let's look at examples. The, the, maybe the earliest example of such disjointness is a classical result of Davenport. So he proved this let's call it orthogonality of Liouville function with e to power two pi i and alpha. But we can now interpret it as uh, an instance of this disjointness. How? So multiplicative rotation on two points, what is sitting behind this is the following statement, that multiplicative rotation on two points is disjoint from additive rotation x going to x plus alpha. Okay, now let's go to WC. <coughs> so he has this beautiful result. Uh, for any irrational alpha and any completely multiplicative function B, you have this, again, let's call it orthogonality. You see, I'm not sure what was motivation of Davenport and WC, but uh, for, for me as an ergodic person, it's so easy to see this indeed as instance of independence, indeed the instance of what we call with foreign disjointness. So reformulation of result of WC is that if you take again a uh, rotation, but this time you compare it, this rotation on torus, you compare or put against multiplicative rotation B of Z goes to B of N times Z. That uh, was a simple example of multiplicative system that I described above. And so we know now that these two systems are disjoint because of result of WC. Of course, if you would prove a theorem of general enough kind, then this will become a corollary. That's uh, one of the things that uh, we are 
doing this for you. Now let us uh, talk about Peter Sarnak's conjecture, which was indeed the, the motivation for this whole business. So Peter has to be praised for giving us a lot of work in ergodic theory because uh, this Sarnak's conjecture has so many uh, facets uh, of ergodic theoretical nature, which are fascinating. So uh, here is uh, one of formulations of Sarnak's conjecture. You take uh, lambda is our Liouville will function, which is very random, as we know. By the way, let me stress random additively. Okay, and I take a deterministic function, which uh, I will talk a little bit more in a moment about, and then they should be orthogonal. This is orthogonality, or if you want independence, or if you want uh, disjointness. Okay. And uh, what is behind this? Well, if function is deterministic. It comes uh, from systems having topological entropy. I will not start introducing topological entropy, but this is a very basic today notion in ergodic theory. And uh, it, uh, topological entropy being zero corresponds to determinism. That's the philosophy in ergodic theory. Systems which have zero entropy can be otherwise uh, pretty or would be chaotic. For example, uh, it can be weakly mixing or strongly mixing for those who know what is strong mixing, but it still may have zero entropy and that's what is needed for determinism, so to say. So uh, another formulation of uh, Sarnak's conjecture is that uh, multiplicative rotation on two points, that's our Liu V, is disjoint from any zero entropy additive topological dynamical system. And I hope after all I said so far, it's tempting now to try to replace lambda of n. You see, a of n is already of the kind we discussed here, right? a of n is already of this kind. If I can replace lambda by something more general, then it will be a dynamical way of thinking about general framework for Sarnak's conjecture. And so let us try to do it. So here is a heuristic principle. It's intentionally called heuristic because uh, it's a, a philosophical state. And so let me state it. So you have a zero entropy additive topological system and you have a low complexity multiplicative topological system. Pay attention why I say low complexity because multiplicatively lambda of n is is very low complexity, okay? So since I want to think now about lambda of n multiplicatively and generalize this, I don't care about low complexity. Now, for any amenable group action or semi-group action, you can define entropy. So it would be tempting to say, for any zero entropy additively and zero entropy multiplicatively, you have these joints. That's actually not true. That's why I say low complexity because that's very, interesting challenging direction of thinking. So what should it be really? What low complexity means? But here is some remark showing to you that low complexity cannot be just zero entry. So here is a simple example. So, and indeed perhaps the most natural example of multiplicative semi-group action. You take, instead of our familiar 2x mod one and its iterations, you take nx mod one. It's easy to see that nx mod one forms a, a semigroup uh, action of n times. But if you take them, and by the way, for all kinds of scaling reasons, uh, this is an action with zero entry. The reason is that for any fixed n, it has positive entry. I don't want to go into this, but this is an action of zero entropy as action of n times. But it's not good for us because you can create from this action deterministic sequences of this form and you will kill this principle. So you also want to avoid local obstructions. And um, that's why you have to introduce notion of aperiodicity. And so here is a definition of aperiodicity. You want to, independence from any periodic sequence. I hope it's a convincing definition. And you want to similarly to define 
a periodicity on multiplicative level. Now here is a conjecture. By the way, I hope I am doing well. Time-wise, I have only one more page after page 12, right? So I'm okay. Okay, good. So here's our conjecture. So you take additive topological dynamical system of zero entropy. You take uh, Ys to be fine. Now it's not principle, it's conjecture. So we hope it's actually true and provable, so to say. So you take now finitely generated multiplicative topological system. And if either of them is aperiodic, then they are disjoint. Now, Sarnak's conjecture corresponds to special case of conjecture one, when y is just a multiplicative rotation on two points. That's the Liouville function. And so here is a, uh, I say aesthetically appealing version, maybe only for Gothic people, sorry about that. But here is a version of uh, our conjecture. Uh, you take a uniquely ergodic additive system and finitely generated and strongly uniquely ergodic multiplicative system. If either of these dynamical systems is a periodic, remember before I was defining a periodicity for sequences, I can define it for systems. Then you have this indeed to me looking aesthetical um, relation. So averages of f of t n x times g of s sub n x tend to independence. Some of the results that I showed before were exactly of this kind. And we know to prove. And uh, an, an instance of this theorem that we know to prove is that if xt is a nil system. So nil systems, by the way, are known to be of zero entropy. Uh, it has a relatively easy reason. Nil systems are so-called distal systems. Systems are distal if no two points go too close along the orbits. And it was an old and uh, relatively simple result of Bill Perry, which says that any distal system has zero end. And so new systems fit the profile and we, for them we can prove it. And uh, one of application is here, which is a general form. So you take a Bezikovich almost periodic function. So let me remind you that Functions are basically almost periodic. Uh, they are defined similar to Bohr almost periodicity, but the metric is different. It is Cesaro averaging on Z. Let me not go into this, but uh, these are natural functions when you deal with integers. So almost periodic functions are more natural when you deal with continuous mathematics, but when you deal with discrete mathematics, Bezikovich seems to be more appropriate. And so uh, this is, of course, an example of disjointness. And the special case will be what I already discussed about, namely uh, this theorem, which can be now viewed as uh, disjointness of characteristic function of uh, square free numbers. It is Bezikovich, by the way. It is Bezikovich. By the way, I wrote here Bezikovich, but it is, of course, Bezikovich. And so Bezikovich, because you get to square free numbers by manipulating. Uh, inclusion, exclusion with infinite arithmetic progressions, okay? <clears throat> and so to finish for today, I will uh, formulate one more curious uniform distribution result, which seems to be quite new. Take just any two polynomials, let's call them wild type polynomials, those polynomials for which you have uniform distribution. So you keep P of N here and uh, in Q you substitute capital omega. And this is still a uh, uniformly distributed sequence in two dimensional torus. Actually, I think we know to prove the following, which is even more impressive in a way. Substitute instead of the first n in this P of n, substitute little omega. This pair will be still uniformly distributed. So P of little omega, comma, Q of large omega as a two dimensional sequence, it's uh, distributed in two dimensional torus. And uh, at this point, I should stop, I guess, because uh, I talked for about 50 minutes, but I will be very glad uh, if there are any questions or discussion. Thank you for attention.